Hi. Um, I'm very excited to present to you this uh, SCOPE meeting. Uh, today, we're going to have Matthias Heinex from Hempels Munich presenting a very exciting topic about designing multi sample single cell experiments to infer personalized regulatory networks. My name is Carlos, and I'm the, the chair today. Uh, so, just a couple of general things. Uh, we have a, a couple, uh, we have changed the format now. So rather than having a bi-weekly, we're going to have we're going to have the scope lectures every month. The next one is the, on the on the fifth of April, and the title will be announced. You will see it on Twitter or on your email list. So we hope that you spread the work and the word and tell people to join. Um, also, for this lecture, if you have a question after the presentation, you can raise your hand. And we're going to notice so you can uh, start asking your questions if, or if you have any comments. Matthias will be very happy to answer them. Okay. So while well, Matthias put his slides uh, up, uh, Matthias is a, a computational biologist. He did his PhD in Max Delbruck, Berlin. Uh, and then he joined uh, the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genomics uh, here also in Berlin. Then he moved to Munich in 2015 to start as a junior group leader. And now he has become a full uh, uh, group leader here at Hemholtz. So while we wait for this, yeah, great. You can see it now. So Matthias, the floor is all yours. Again, if you have any questions, remember to raise your hand and put it in the comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much um, for having me here. And I'm excited to talk about designing our multi-sample experiments with the goal to um, infer personalized regulatory networks. Actually, when I prepared the talk, I, I noticed that it's not gonna be so much room to actually really talk about many of the design aspects because I want to share also the analysis, but um, you will see uh, in a minute. So, Overall, in my lab, our mission is to develop AI solutions for personalized network-based precision medicine. And uh, we usually do this by starting out with population cohorts that we can measure with multi-omics data. And so far, we have developed algorithms to infer disease-associated networks to understand the molecular underpinnings. Now, in this talk, I would like to show you how we can, um, by using single cell data in those population cohorts, not um, only infer a single disease-associated network, but actually a whole population of personalized networks. And uh, this uh, will be crucial for precision medicine applications um, in the future. So in the lab, we are mainly focusing on cardiovascular diseases, for example, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, coronary artery disease, and myocardial infarction. So all of those are actually a complex diseases, and uh, that means that they are caused by a multitude of environmental and genetic factors. And um, genome-wide association studies have been a method of choice to identify actually individual DNA sequence variants that um, are associated with each of these phenotypes. But if we look more closely, um, we see that 95% of those variants that are associated with phenotypes are actually non-protein coding. And also um, that there are hundreds or thousands of variants with very small effect for each phenotype. And so um, to understand um, how this um, can be mechanistically, the, the um, community came up with the hypothesis that these variants affect um, gene regulation. And so I will um, introduce a little bit how we can use um, the integrated analysis of those genome-wide association studies with um, gene expression, in particular expression quantitative trait loci to, to shed light on this. Um, and then, of course, we we'll move into the, into the single cell applications. So um, if those non-coding variants really um, affect regulatory elements, and we should be able to actually also pinpoint which uh, genes they affect. And this is what is being done when we talk about expression quantitative trait loci. So we want to identify candidate causal genes. And we do this by correlating the genotypes of the disease-associated genetic markers with the expression levels of nearby genes in large population cohorts. And uh, this would identify very likely disease candidate genes, which we call um, EQTLs for short. We have successfully done that 
um, on the transcriptome level in the human heart. And we also um, showed that these effects propagate not only on the um, RNA level, but also on protein level. And we could identify hundreds of loci that affect actually both um, molecular layers um, and are associated with atrial fibrillation. So I've been stressing a lot that we need to look at the at the right tissue here. So we've been focusing on, on the heart, but of course, um, and to this audience, it's pretty obvious that uh, looking at the right tissue may not be enough. And we actually need to also look at uh, the right cells. And uh, the reason for that is, is shortly illustrated here. So if we look at this hypothetical tissue, um, which is composed of red and blue cells, and uh, we look at a gene that is highly expressed in the red cells, then we would, of course, uh, expect that if there is a genetic um, variant that impacts the expression, we would be able to identify that in the red cells. But if this gene is not expressed in the blue ones, we would also not really see this effect. So what does that mean on the tissue level? If we, if we monitor expression on the tissue, we might still be able to find it if the cell composition is um, sort of balance between those two cell types. But if this um, um, balance changes and we have uh, the blue cells dominating the tissue, we might actually not be able to find this uh, genetic effect. So we might miss these cell type specific disease genes. And um, one way around this is um, can be uh, achieved with statistical deconvolution. So here I'm showing an example where we did not look at gene expression, but DNA methylation, but you can sort of exchange the, this quantitative phenotype that we look at and correlate with um, genetics here for methylation. Um, and we looked at whole blood um, as the tissue. And by using um, gene expression markers of cell types, we were able to estimate the proportion of um, the different cell types in the, in the mixture. So in this case, we divided um, people in our cohort into those that have high levels of um, CD8 T cells and those that have low that are shown here with the different colors. I'm sorry, uh, what happens? Um, as a covariate um, into this model, and you can clearly see that there is actually um, a difference in the effect sizes between those people that have high or low um, um, portions of CD8 T cells. So we this this can be this is what is called an interacting QTL or cell type interacting QTL, <clears throat> and we can interpret this as actually a cell type specific QTL when we validated this uh, when we look at sort sorted cells, and you can see that this effect is indeed most strongly pronounced in the CD8 T cells and absent in other cell types like monocytes. The cool thing is we can also use this and um, improve our ability to understand uh, trait associated loci. Here we, we looked at an asthma locus, and you can see that it's overlapping with this interacting QTL, but not when we uh, look at the whole tissue. So, by adding this, this cell, type, cell type information, we were able to interpret this locus, which we would not have been um, possible otherwise. So we can actually make use of this deconvolution approach, but um, there's, of course, more direct ways, and that is um, single cell genomics. And um, here I'm showing an example of um, one of the first um, single cell QTL analysis that has been done by a collaboration partner in the Lude Franke lab in, in Groningen, and they demonstrate that it's actually possible to identify cell type specific regulatory effects um, using single cell genomics. The problem is, of course, that doing single cell genomics in a large population cohort is quite expensive. And so that you really need to think carefully about um, how we can design the most powerful experiments for a given budget. So for example, should we include more samples or sequence more cells? Um, or sequence them deeper. And to answer this question, we have developed um, SC Power, which is the first um, generalizable and scalable tool for this purpose. And we've designed it to be able to design QTL experiments, but also differential gene expression. Um, compared to previous tools, 
based on simulations, it's really orders of magnitude faster and it has a very user friendly interface. Um, and if you like to use it, I can only recommend visiting our website or, or downloading the R package. <clears throat> when we apply this to, to a large number of different uh, scenarios, we can come up with some general recommendations that are valid in many settings. So overall, the recommendation would be to go for more cells, but sequence them in a shallow way that gives you optimal power to also go for low, more lowly expressed genes. Okay, so <clears throat> unfortunately, there's, there's not so much time to dive deeper into this design aspect because I wanted to focus more on the um, network aspect. So the second observation from Jeevas um, was that we actually have these hundreds to even thousands of small effect sizes that affect or variants with small effect sizes for each phenotype. And um, one possible way to understand that is to, to think of them as being connected in regulatory networks. And so one um, unique opportunity that, that single cell genomics can give us is actually that we can not only <clears throat> infer a single regulatory network for the whole population, but we can actually do this in a so I'm going to introduce this concept um, here. So um, the fact that we have actually multiple observations for each person um, allows us to look into gene-wise or gene, gene uh, into the co-expression relations between pairs of genes in a person-wise way. So only looking at cells from one person, we can infer co-expression between pairs of genes. We can scale this up to the whole population. Um, and now we obtain as a result, a whole population of person specific regulatory networks, which we can then compare to the genome. And when we compare the, the topology of those networks, um, specific in people with one genotype or the other, we can identify polymorphisms that actually determine those co-expression relations between pairs of genes. And this is what we would call a co-expression QTL or co-EQTL for short. So this is really a nice way of linking genotypes to um, the network topology. And it allows us to personalize gene regulatory networks as a function of genotype. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show work um, by Kat uh, Katharina Schmidt, which she did um, <clears throat> in close collaboration with the lab of Rude Franke um, from Groningen, who's also running the single cell EQTL gen consortium. So to give you an overview, um, we, we started out by with a, a large meta-analysis of um, single cell um, PBMC data sets in our total of 187 individuals. And as the first step, we wanted to establish um, what is actually a good measure to really relate and connect pairs of genes <clears throat> in such a network based on single cell transformic data. Um, second question was then, how can we then link these co-expression relations to genetics? So that's what we call it, um, co-expression QTLs. And then finally, how can we actually interpret the, the findings that we get? So starting out now with the, with the first question, <clears throat> what is a good um, association measure? So of course, before we can answer that, we need to say what what uh, do we understand by by good uh, good measure? And um, this is sort of now coming to the question of how how do we actually evaluate and uh, validate these different networks? And what um, we were doing here is actually taking the approach that we look at the um, association measures between all pairs of genes um, that we consider and we compare their quantitative values across different data sets. So that is sort of a uh, concordance or replication between data sets of pairwise co-expression relations. So you can also think of as correlation of correlations. And if we look at the um, same cell types, um, a good association measure should give us uh, concordant values for different data sets. And we compared that um, across the different single cell data sets that we had in our study. So here you see a comparison of, of five different data sets and um, those um, values give you basically the correlation of correlations, which is actually quite high 
um, across all of the pairs of data sets that we <coughs> investigated. We also wanted to know how does this compare um, to co-expression relations that we would get from uh, bulk data sets. And here we looked at two um, that have cell type sorted data available um, and at a bulk data set that um, it was not cell type sorted. And you can see that um, the association or the correlation of correlations um, drops. So that means that the concordance between the networks is, is a bit lower here, but um, we wanted to sort of see where, how, how to, uh, how to, or what to conclude from that. And for this, we also compared um, different um, bike data sets with each other. <clears throat> and we can see that actually the associations that we get between the different bike data sets is also um, in, in comparable range. So actually saying that these um, single cell data sets compare better with each other than um, single cell versus bike and also better than bike versus bike. So we can say that we can infer um, networks of comparable quality from the single cell data. Of course, um, this is strongly dependent on expression levels, uh, as you can see here in this, in this bar plot. So the um, x-axis is the threshold of a number or percentage of um, cells expressing a gene, and the higher we go, the better concordance we get also between our know, single cell and bike data. So concluding from that is that, yes, uh, these are comparable approaches and that the single cell <clears throat> quality depends on, on expression levels. As a second approach um, for validating this um, association measure, we um, also looked at um, CRISPR data. And here we would expect that genes that are differentially expressed when you knock out one gene uh, of the network, um, that those that, that um, react to this um, perturbation should also be connected in the network. And this is actually what we see for many of these knockouts. Finally, um, we also compared between the different people. Um, and we can see that there's actually seems to be a cell type specific effect here. Um, <clears throat> but then if we, if we um, remember that also, of course, these cell types come at uh, different frequencies, we can see that this is actually the explanation for this observation. So it's it's not really a genuine um, cell type specific effect that networks are, are better reproducible be between people, but this is just a technical um, <clears throat> aspect that is caused by the number of cells that we can actually consider in each of the cell types. So we conclude basically that single cell RNA seq can be used in a similar way as, as the bulk. Um, RNA seq to, to construct and co expression networks, and it depends on expression levels and on cell numbers. So, we also, I mean, what I didn't show is that, that we compared uh, the Spearman correlation also to, to other network uh, reconstruction approaches uh, based on the, on the metrics that I've just shown. And um, we've seen that it's actually the most uh, robust and, of course, also the, the fastest and easiest to use. So, that we basically move on with, with this simple um, approach for our um, next question, which is how can we now relate these um, co-expression networks to genetics? Um, and we want to, of course, do this as exhaustive as possible, but you can imagine that if we compare <clears throat> all pairs of genes with all SNPs in the genome, that we have a huge um, search space that we need to screen and maybe most of these tests would not actually be expected to yield results. So to home in on those um, triplets basically of SNPs and, and genes, um, we first selected genes to, um, that have an cis eqtl so where we know a SNP is affecting the expression of a, what we call e-gene. And then um, we would basically test systematically across all the potential um, co-e-genes uh, whether the SNP induces a difference in the co-expression pattern as shown here on the right side. So for example, in the AA genotype, um, people with AA genotype would have a strong co-expression relation between uh, the E gene and the co-E gene, while those with the CC genotype do not. Of course, you can think that there's still uh, many possible co-E genes. And so the second um, criterion that we <coughs> applied is that at least uh, in, in a certain fraction of people, 
uh, in, in this case 10%, we require that there is actually a significant correlation between <coughs> this um, E gene and the CoE gene. So basically meaning there has to be an edge in at least some of the personal networks. And then finally, we also devised a new permutation-based um, strategy to um, account for the correlation structure between the different CoE genes that we test for each um, SNP and to adjust for the multiple tests that we do. So um, <clears throat> what do we get when we apply this? We um, identify actually um, quite a lot of um, gene pairs, so 900, around 950 gene pairs um, associated with, 20, uh, with 72 SNPs. And I'm just showing one example here on the right side. So each um, of these lines represents uh, one person um, and um, shows basically a regression of the expression levels across the cells of, these, of this person between the uh, two genes that are shown here on the X and Y axis. And you can clearly see that um, the, these lines differ by color and these lines in, and the colors indicate <coughs> The genotype. So we can, in this example, actually see that there's even opposite direction of effect. So <clears throat> positive correlation in the GG um, genotype, while the CC has a negative association. <clears throat> now, um, we um, split this up by the cell type. We can see that actually most of those Findings are um, cell type specific, as shown in this in this upset plot. Um, <clears throat> but what what is the quality of this? I mean, um, are they are, are those real um, genetic findings, or is this just um, artifacts? And to answer that question, we try to run a replication analysis um, using a large um, bulk um, data set that is uh, was done in, in whole blood. Um, so of course, I mean, you, the, the whole point is we want to get these um, co-expression relations, um, which we can't get actually in a, in a person-specific way if we just have one um, data point per, per person. <clears throat> but we can resort to, to a similar strategy as um, in the bulk deconvolution setting. But instead of, of using cell type proportion as the interacting Fact, we use um, the expression of the CoE gene and then introduce this interaction term between SNP and CoE gene to be able to identify if there is actually genotype dependent difference in the co-expression between those two genes in the, in the bulk data set. Uh, in the center is um, a scatter plot of the effect sizes where the x-axis shows the effect in the single cell data and the y-axis shows the effect um, in the bulk deconvolution analysis. And um, they are highly concordant, uh, which means what is ideal with this RB value, which is quite high across many of the cell types. So these are highly robust um, co-expression features. <laughs> now I'm talking again a bit um, on how can we actually derive um, a plot for future um, experimental design from that. So one of the um, aspects that we looked at is what is the impact of um, the number of cells? And you can clearly see that um, the co-expression QTR identification is dependent on the number of cells in a more or less um, linear fashion. And the same is true also for the number of samples. And you can appreciate that the effect of the sample size is much more pronounced, so um, this would lead to the recommendation that you um, um, should first increase sample size before increasing cell numbers for um, the project. Now, finally, um, we also wanted to see um, how we can actually interpret these what uh, these co-expression QTLs. What what can we actually learn from that? <laughs> and um, for that. We devised this interpretation scheme. So we wanted to assess um, if we if we can first of all um, use it to to understand better what's going on in um, in Jiva's um, low side. And so we ask if a, a SNP that is a co-EQTL or a couple of 
gene pairs, whether it's a, uh, associated with a GVAS trait. And then if uh, we can actually connect this <clears throat> to the genes with which the E gene is differentially co-expressed depending on the genotype. So we would like to see that actually those genes are also associated with uh, similar traits. So we, we look for enrichment of GVAS traits across those um, interacting loci. Also would like to see if these are sharing uh, similar functions, which would um, argue for, for a case that there's actually a functional module with which the um, E gene is co-expressed with in some genotypes and not in the others. And of course, <laughs> we would like to gain some mechanistic understanding, which um, could wonderfully explain these, these differences in the, in the co-expression. Um, and we look at uh, transcription vector binding sites in this case. Matthias, yes. uh, the, the quality of the sound is a bit broken. Okay. We can't really understand what you're saying. Is it better now? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, because I had some warnings uh, of my headset that the uh, battery is running empty. <laughs> okay. So if it's if it's good like that, then let's continue. Um, okay. So um, yeah. So so we we had one um, particularly interesting um, example, which is um, which was a locus um, around uh, the gene RPS twenty six. Um, so it's it's a locus <clears throat> that is associated with different immune-mediated disease, in particular rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, MS, type 1 diabetes. But uh, the puzzling um, fact is that this RPS26 is a ribosomal gene, so it's not at all really related to, to any immune function um, a priori. Um, and this was really a hub gene that was connected with, with hundreds of, um, um, of CoE genes. And so when we when we then actually looked into this in more in depth, we, we noticed that there's actually also opposite um, direction of effect of this association <clears throat> for um, different cell types. So we see that um, actually in the CD4 and the monocytes, we have mostly positive or many positively associated um, or positive effect size of that SNP. On the co-expression relationship, while um, in the in the uh, remaining cells, this is mo mostly negative. And so um, we focused in, on those, and we um, actually saw that um, this is related to um, lymphocyte activation. So, filling up our interpretation scheme for this for this um, locus, <clears throat> we we observed that. We have um, association at this uh, locus with au uh, autoimmune disease, in particular rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, MS, and hay fever. And um, when we now look at the associations at these interacting genes, we see that actually they're also enriched for associations with the same traits. They share this lymphocyte activation as a mm -hmm. common um, functional annotation, and they also share um, common binding sites. So basically, the TF would regulate both the, the co-E genes and, um, and the E gene, and the dif differential binding would sort of decouple it um, from the rest of this, of this cluster. And so we can propose for this um, locus where, where previously no immune function was, was known that it's actually um, re, um, that the the, there are immune specific regulators of RPS26 that are altered in their binding by the SNP, which impacts then various autoimmune diseases. So, um, <clears throat> to sum up, um, we have established the quite, um, let's say, simple, easy to use, and easy to interpret uh, robust Spearman correlation as a measure to um, infer these person specific networks. Um, we have established a um, co-expression QTL identification strategy, um, which is based on, on strict filtering. Um, it also suggested that large numbers of cells and large sample sizes are required, and that it's favorable to first increase sample size to increase the power. And I've shown you in the last um, piece that um, we can uh, interpret these um, co-expression QTLs 
to identify functional modules around these disease-associated genetic variants. So if you're interested in more details, we have <clears throat> this now accepted in genome biology and it should be um, out soon. And uh, if you can't wait, the, the preprint is also available. And I would like to acknowledge um, that this has been um, mainly the work of Katharina Schmidt together with <clears throat> the lab of Lude Franke, in particular, um, Shuang Li, who has been driving this from, um, from the Groningen side. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthias. That was very nice. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, we're going to give you the floor. No questions for Matthias? You can also write them in the chat if you if you're shy. Okay, Hela. Hello, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. Yeah, you said that um, for the second step, basically large cell numbers or large sample sizes are required, but not all immune cells. Yeah are resulting in large sample sizes or large cell numbers. I mean, if, I think you've shown this um, example in one plot um, with the different immune cell types. And for example, for the B cells, it was really low, the correlation. Mm -hmm. Was there any way to improve it except for larger sample sizes? Because I mean, if you don't have more cell numbers in your tissue, then it's biologically seen maybe a bit difficult. Yeah, I mean, and I think, well, okay, this comes back to I guess other other um, experimental setups as well, but I mean, in this case, uh, if you're interested in a rare population, then you might need to enrich for that first um, using fax. I mean, for blood, that's definitely possible. I mean, for, for other tissues, it might be more difficult. But I mean, for <laughs> if you don't want to do that, then I mean, the only way that that can help you is is to look at many, many, many more cells, which is then, of course, quite expensive. Mm, okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I mean, well, maybe one more question. Um, in that sense, what does a large cell number mean? Because if I am rigid for fax, like, what do I need to expect as a cell number so I can work with this method, for example? Mm, so I think, um, yeah, if you if you have a, f um, so I mean, you need uh, of course per person, let's say a few hundred, that would be that would be good. So. Um, I mean, of course, if you can go into the thousand, it's it's better. But um, let's say <laughs> um, if you stay realistic, then I mean, let's say five hundred or so is, is a good start per person for for each cell type. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat, Matthias. And the person is, oh, what sorry, type I... of what type of power or number of cell sequencing depth do you need to pick up these co EQTLs reliably? <clears throat> well, I mean, so we, we've done this um, this sampling based uh, assessment, so um, which you can which you can see here. So I mean, you can um, also work with with rare numbers of cells, um, even below a hundred, still possible. But um, I mean, especially if you look at the CD four, which is the one that we that we have subsampled. I mean, you can see that. Um, you you can clearly um, expect much more if you <clears throat> if you have more cells, but um, with samples it's it's even more important. And I, I mean you can do it with small numbers, um, but then you will only find uh, yeah relatively small numbers um, of um, of co -EQTLs. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question: At which date and how do you integrate individual specific co-expression network in this analysis? Um, so, well, I mean, so so here in, in this case, we um, we simply use the quantitative co-expression measure and we, we, we only used it basically in the pre-filtering 
where we say that there should be an edge in, in at least uh, a certain fraction of, of people so that we would actually consider uh, a gene pair to, for, for being tested in this um, co-EQTL analysis. Thank you. Uh... But I mean, maybe to, to make this clear, so the, these um, these edges that, that we show here, those are all um, connections in the network that, that change between people um, depending on which genotype they have. So that is basically how, how this personal information is in, entering here, but we aggregate it on the level of, of the genotypes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we have a long question. So one is, are you focused on eGene and cogene pairs, or is there any way to decipher a small subnetwork more than two genes instead of the pairs? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, um, we, we also thought about this. I mean, it, it would be nice to to go on, on more, let's say, uh, higher level topological features of the network. Um, we have we have not um, tried it yet, um, but you could imagine, of course, <clears throat> looking at something like like modules or presence absence of modules, or at uh, at some um, yeah, also looking at features like like the degree or or things that change. Um, um, yeah, when you when you when you aggregate basically across uh, across network neighborhoods as well, um, but um, so far we have not tried that yet. Okay, uh, we have time for two more questions, I guess. Um, when you identify co-EQTLs by correlations, are you using expression from single cell? If so, do you do anything to overcome dropout events? Like for example, cell the clustering, sorry. Cell yeah, I mean, this is a good question. I mean, we, we are doing it based on single cell, of course. Um, um, so far, the only thing that we that we do is basically look at, at um, uh, at highly expressed genes because <laughs> we don't have so much this this problem but we have tried a few strategies like the meta cell approach which um which is a way to impute without actually introducing additional cor uh, or artificial correlations because i mean this is sort of the uh yeah the thing that you have to really be careful about that that you don't inflate your um your co-expression relations because you you are um, imputing by using um, the, the um, expression levels of, of your neighboring cells and and the meta cell is sort of disjunct sets of cells on which you could then do the the pseudo bike which would then um, of course increase the number of cells that you can look at the problem with this was that um yeah the meta cells would give you relatively small numbers of meta cells which then decreases again of course the power to to detect um, correlations so there's a trade-off and we have not um really uh, a, f a final opinion on 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 if it works <laughs> or not but <laughs> i think it's still a, a, a quite a promising um route to to look at okay uh yeah we have Time. Still time. Uh, for interpreting G was hit. What's the advantage of identifying coequals or a simple linking genotype you know, to cell proportions? That's a good one. Yeah. So I think I mean. The, <clears throat> so I I think you get two different um two different uh, things that um because the co-expression relation. I mean we do it in a cell type specific way, so it should be independent of um of cell type proportions. Um, so you would. Basically, I think get two different kinds of interpretation of the of your GBAS um, locus. One would be well, it affects um, abundance of your cell type. The other would be it affects um, the network within the cell type. So that's I think would be my my interpretation. Okay. Oh, if you have time for one more. They said, what's the accuracy of EQTL, co-EQTL model in bulk? Uh, it is quite similar to an idea proposed by Piotr Bavaris, I don't know, in the MALA tool. Are you aware of this or? Uh, not, not really, but I think, um, I mean, yeah, so there is there is definitely some um, um, concordance with, with this, but I mean, one also has to, has to keep in mind that, um, that this bulk data set is, um, 
I mean, this is like 3,000 people versus versus 200. So I mean, it's um, mm. only possible, of course, if you if you have these large <clears throat> sample sizes, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Very nice. Thank you, Matthias. That's very interesting. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the questions. And uh, it was quite a nice discussion. And um, a reminder that we have the next meeting on the 5th of April. If you have more questions, please do reach out to Matthias. I think that Matthias, you put your contact at the end, right? Um, in the last slide, just in that case. Or if you're interested in his work, also look at his uh, preprint. Yeah, I think that I don't have the email on it, but I think you can find me. <laughs> you can find him on Twitter. <laughs> Helmholtz, um, unique. <laughs> or Helmholtz. Yeah. Yeah, thanks right. again for the discussion and for your interest. And yeah, looking forward to, to hear from you. Thank you, everybody. And have a nice afternoon and rest of the week. Take care. Bye.